Hey, Rob. Thanks for joining me today, friend. Thanks, Tosh. And I'm glad to be here, man. So uh, I think I found you because earlier this year I was uh, I made a sort of a post about Buddhism's marketing problem and Shinzen talking about that. And you replied very kindly and said, hey, I've been interested in Buddhism for a while. And, you know, of course, I'm interested in marketing. And uh, after that, I checked out your stuff and just I think there was like a day where I read like a day or two where I read almost all of the stuff that you'd written in a day or two and really loved it. And it's been really helpful for my project. So I'm happy we have this chance to kind of get to know each other better and hear more about the work that you've been up to. Yeah, I mean, it'll be it'll be interesting to figure out really what is the work that I've been up to mm -hmm. because it, like I was telling you before we started recording, it has uh, changed gears a bit since I think you initially found me. Although maybe not that much, but we can we can get into that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe to start, I'd just love to hear kind of about you personally and your life and where you've been and what you've been up to and in whatever detail you'd like to share about your background and story. <laughs> And also here's my cat Swanson. Hey Anybody Swanson. Watches this. <laughs> he is the real uh it's the guy who's in charge in this household. At least for the past 10, 15, maybe 20 years, creativity has been just a core part of my life in some form or another. Um, I think it started with guitar back when I was in middle school. I was I was kind of a problem child. Um after like after my stepdad died and I moved around a lot, I had that just like rebellious shitty teenager thing going on where you know I just like shoplifting a bunch and all the things I got expelled from middle school mm -hmm. there's a whole there was a whole uh period where it kind of felt like my life was just like veering off the rails in one way or another um but somewhere in there I was at a at a boarding school in Mississippi an Episcopalian boarding school of all things um I somehow stumbled into playing guitar and it was one of those things where kind of immediately it captivated all of my attention, like between classes and whatever, I'd just be in my room, like, I don't know, it probably started out with really simple songs. It's like, guys, check out me playing Smoke on the Water and Seven Nation Army and like all these things you can do on one string. Um, but it, it just slowly turned into one of those things where I was playing four, six, eight hours a day. Um, and it felt like, for the first time, I had a, a creative, generative outlet for all my like destructive teenage boy energy, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, and that lasted six years, eight years, the sort of love affair with guitar, where it was my every waking being. Like I um, very nearly went to college for, um, you know, it was going to be a mix of like jazz, um, like jazz ensemble and music production. I was going to build my own degree about that and then um, was too lazy to actually audition for the jazz program at the University of Denver where I went. So I ended up studying film instead. But that, uh, I guess that decision started me down the film path, which maybe encompassed the next eight to 10 years of my life where did the indie filmmaker thing did um i don't i don't even know like that's a whole story on its own like my falling in and out of love with the film world um but broadly speaking that i would say is is my background that brought me up to to you know 2020 and deciding to start on gaiden and doing all the things i'm doing now was there's there's always been a just a creative streak in me, a streak of wanting to tell stories, do some sort of meaningful work in the world. Um, and for the past five or six years, there's also been a, a marketing streak of me wanting to understand how to reach and connect with people and communicate in ways that are emotionally resonant and compelling. Um, and I'd also say for the past couple of years, there's been a real cynical streak around marketing, around looking around and just being really off put about how people treat each other online um, and how people treat their customers and their, their prospects or whatever as they try to build businesses. A lot of it is, is highly impersonal or impersonal. A lot of it is very manipulative. And so that's sort of been like the driving factor behind a lot of what I've been doing is how can we make all of this deeply human? How can we sort of like merge creativity and marketing and connection and doing meaningful work. Um, like those are a lot of the strands that have sort of led me to, again, wherever it is I am now, I'm not sure. 
So. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about your history of film and kind of what you did in the film mm -hmm. world? Yeah, it's messy. It's all over the place. Um, I went to film school not knowing anything because I was a music guy prior to that, but I was always just kind of captivated by by film and movies as a as a kid. Um, I spent two to three years probably thinking that I would be you know the next great indie director. You know, somebody. I don't. I, like it's interesting to say somebody like Tarantino because he's like at the top of whatever you know, like '90s Tarantino who's just like making edgy, interesting, weird stuff. Um, I somewhere along the way, I don't, I don't know exactly where this insight came from, but I realized that it was a terrible way to make a living. To like, I'm gonna go to Hollywood and be a famous director is just, or at least, at least somebody who's like not gonna be in the Hollywood machine and wants to do things independently is like asking for the life of a starving artist, basically. So somewhere there, I switched gears, pivoted a little bit, and went all in on cinematography, on being a, a craftsperson working you know, below the line as they speak. Although I guess in industry jargon, cinematographers are not below the line. Um, what does below yeah, the line like, mean? It's, um, I'm trying to think of, exactly what the distinction is it's um there's like i think it's everybody who's not explicitly named in like the credits who doesn't have their own title card um but i'm i'm not sure what the actual distinction is but it's essentially like lowly crew versus like very higher up management positions for mm -hmm. lack of a better way of putting it mm -hmm. um but yeah i got i got really in the weeds on cinematography for a while it's it's kind of an immense art form the like it's everything that's beautiful about about photography like the interplay of of shadow and light and composition and all of these really beautiful things you can do there mixed with movement mixed with moving the camera around mixed with the added element of time um it's just such a rich and profound art form that kind of captivated me and still does like it's it's my favorite part of you know some of the shows and movies that I still watch these days but I eventually had another come to Jesus moment maybe in terms of realizing what a career in cinematography would mean whether it was going to be moving to LA moving to Atlanta New York one of these hubs because I was in Denver at the time it's not a place where one makes a go as a professional cinematographer like unless you just want to make like, uh, I don't know, like industrial videos or, or commercial videos or whatever. Um, but I, there is like one of the things that just hit me is I got really, really burned out from working on other people's sets. I got really burned out from working 12, 14, 16 hour days on projects that I wasn't crazy about. And for some reason, it just kind of hit me that I was in for like 10 to 15 to 20 years of this if I really wanted to make it to the level that I was aspiring to be. Like you go to Hollywood, you you play the game. Like it's it's a very rigidly top-down industry, a lot, lot of hierarchy, a lot of power games, a lot of politics. And there's a lot of, um, like there's really no way to get to certain places in that world without quote unquote paying your dues, which I believe is awesome for certain types of people. But I you know, I projected my life outward and was like, no, I don't think that's how I want to spend every waking minute for the next 20 years. Um, and so that was what kind of led me away from working in the film industry to sort of exploring other things. I started writing for a, a big filmmaking blog at the time. Um, I started like that's somewhere along the way I started picking up marketing and copywriting and all the various things that I do. And I don't know, it just created this completely different path where eventually I was, got sick of writing for a, a clickbaity blog. It was, I don't know, it was a blog in like the 2010s, like early 2010s, where it's just like a clickbait headline followed by 200 words of, of not really anything, but it drove a lot of traffic and they sold a lot of ads against it. So there you go. Um, but yeah, I got I got tired of that, started my own website, which eventually became my first business, um, which is called Filmmaker Freedom. 
um, where I tried to marry these ideas of creating cool independent art, whatever that means, whether it's short films, features, series, and then going directly to audiences, not playing the, the industry distribution game where you have to you know, submit to a, a whole bunch of film festivals, hope you find a, a sales agent or a distributor, and then hopefully they get you onto a major platform. And there's just layer upon layer upon layer of middlemen, basically, that, that make it impossible for somebody to make a living that way unless you're in that that upper echelon, you know, that, that very, you know, top 0.1% of indie filmmakers is really sort of like a, let's, let's democratize marketing and entrepreneurship online because there is, there is so much reach. You can reach hyper-specific types of audiences. You can, you can win their attention away from, from big budget stuff. If you are more relevant, if you are more resonant with the, those niche interests that they care about. Um, and yeah, I did that for a couple of years and then got burned out from that too. <laughs> yeah. How did the uh, Ungated project come about? Yeah. That came about because I got burned out in the film world. I got, I think, I think slow, it was slowly over time, I realized that I just wasn't a filmmaker anymore. I was more passionate, intellectually curious. Um, I don't know, whatever the right word is there, around, around marketing, around creativity more generally, around creating weird little communities on the internet that are, that are hyper specific and full of you know, weird people doing interesting things. Um, and increasingly it felt like that wasn't a fit in the filmmaking world. So not only was I not making films myself and I didn't really have that desire or drive anymore. It kind of just disappeared on me sometime in the, the preceding years. But yeah, I just, I just had this sense that the work I was doing in the filmmaking community, despite the fact that I still think it was very ahead of its time, very, very real and applicable for the right people more than anything, it felt like nobody actually wanted what I was selling. Um, it felt like I was trying to change a culture more than anything, because you know the there is a there is sort of a built-in culture of you make whatever film you want to make, you take it to festivals, you because because th these are the stories that are sort of passed down on high. These are you know it's the stories of, of Tarantino and the Coen Brothers and whoever else Robert Rodriguez in the '90s with El Mariachi, which he made for like seven grand or some crap, and then um, you know and then spun that out into this this epic career. Um, and despite the fact that those stories don't really map onto reality anymore because the world has proliferated or like digital technology has exploded things. There's more competition. There's like all sorts of crazy things happening in this world that make it deeply, deeply unlikely that you can make a living that way. People are still emotionally invested in that narrative. And it felt like I was spending pretty much all of my time trying to change people's minds about what they wanted. I was kind of in that space of yo, look at all the cool possibilities. If you learn marketing, if you learn entrepreneurship, if you learn to identify specific audiences that you, you care about or resonate with and make stuff just for them, all of that is very true. It's all very viable, but it's not what people and filmmakers in particular want to hear. Um, and I think, yeah, it just, it, I don't know, it felt Sisyphean maybe just like rolling a boulder up a hill only to have it come rolling back down on you every night. Like it just became a burden to try to change people's minds. And I, somewhere in the pandemic, like very early in the pandemic, um, it just struck me, I don't know, is the nature of lockdown is just having way too much time to sit and marinate in your thoughts. It just struck me that this is not what I want to be doing anymore. Um, yeah, but that, that, spark of creativity that that wanting to help people do interesting vibrant delightful weird creative work on the internet and actually make a living with it like that fire was still burning bright i think it just it just needed to be disconnected from the film world because it and i don't know that's not to say that there aren't filmmakers who can still benefit from what i'm doing but 
broadly speaking, it feels like I just needed to make a, a clean break because it was uh, it was kind of suffocating for mm -hmm. lack of a better word. Yeah, and it sounds like you know the kinds of ideas that you had were far more broadly applicable than just the the film world. So. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you did that. I mean, if I, if you just stuck there, I, I might not have found you. So, um, what what would you say is the like guiding intent or the aim of Ungated and the kind of content you're trying to produce there? Mm. This is one of those areas where I feel like if you'd asked me this a year ago, I would have said one thing, and now I'm going to say something completely different. Actually, I'll just give you both answers. That might be fun. Is just to see. This trans, uh, yeah, this transition that's been happening or transformation, if it's a better word. A year ago, I would have told you that I wanted to make the missing instruction manual for 1,000 true fans, which I think I still actually do. But and can you my, just say what that is in case someone's not familiar? Yeah, yeah. Um, so 1,000 true fans is Kevin Kelly's like super mega famous essay that posits to make a living as a creative person, a writer, a filmmaker, a podcaster, a YouTuber, etc. You don't need to reach millions of people. You don't need to reach the, the crazy massive scale that was a prerequisite for succeeding in previous eras. Um, instead, you only need what he says is 1,000 true fans. A true fan is somebody who will buy anything and everything you make. I think the, the definition he gives is like somebody who will, you know, buy the super premium top tier box set version or who will drive 300 miles to see you perform in concert and then buy a shit ton of your merch. Is there are people, for lack of a better way of putting it, who you have deeply bonded with, emotionally connected with, resonated with so fervently. I don't know if that's the right word either, but people who you've, who've you've resonated with to the point where they're like, hell yes, I want anything and everything this guy does and I'm willing to throw money at him hand over fist. <laughs> um, but like, that's the idea is you find 1,000 of these people um, and you can make a living. And the, you know, the math is what, $10 a month, $100 a year um, from these, these thousand true fans and you have yourself a, a healthy six figure income or something near it. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's the basic idea is you don't need to reach millions of people. You can reach a relatively narrow slice of the market, a narrow slice of the population, and then do work that is uniquely tailored to you work that is weird work that would never appeal to the mainstream. Um, and create this, this sort of beautiful feedback loop where you're doing work that it really matters to you, that really matters to a small handful of people, and it's economically viable and delightful for everybody involved. Hmm. So originally you're trying to create the instruction manual for how to do that. Yeah. And as I say all that, I still, I still am, right? Like it's, it's still about doing that I don't know. I think I think I'm more in tune with like weird work now, doing work that is really kind of edgy and fun and and intellectually stimulating and following those those you know intellectual rabbit holes that you find um, all the way to the end. And I think the distinction that I would make is that a year ago, I was I was very traditional in my marketing thinking. I was influenced by the direct response world. A lot of, um, I don't know if that phrase rings a bell for you, but it's essentially, you know, people who are selling shit on the internet. There's two, two uh, I guess, styles of, of marketing. One is like brand advertising or brand marketing, where it's just, we're going to get our brand or our image or our, or our message out in front of people. Um, no need for them to buy. We're just like planting seeds and, and creating awareness and repetition. And then direct response is putting messages out into the world to get people to buy shit. It's like when you get a, it's like you land on a sales page or you see an ad that leads to a sales page and all of it is measurable. All of it is, um, yeah, I think that's the big thing is it's measurable. You can, you can measure what this ad is doing. You can measure how many people click through, how many people actually buy, yada, yada, yada. So that's where I spent my last five to six years in business is really in the direct response world. 
So learning how to do copywriting, learning how to set up funnels, you know, <laughs> like email marketing systems, um, learning how to how to write sort of like persuasive, slick, emotionally compelling copy, um, all of these things. And I think that was going to be like the the intellectual foundation for the initial iteration of Ungated it was like I'm going to teach creative people how to use these tools of of direct response of um, whatever else to build a a relatively mechanistic business, something that functions in the way that you think it should. Like you put something in one end, something um, is a really bad bad description, but I think mechanistic is the right the right word. Um, ungated now, and the way I'm doing this thousand true fans thing now. is about being playful and giving fewer fucks and not trying to control things and leading from a place of, of friendliness and generosity and weirdness and not fitting yourself into anything rigid, not trying to be like, this is my niche, I am the such and such guy, but instead letting your freak flag fly for lack of a better way of putting it and just being weird and vibing on the internet and then making a living from that. And it's not mechanistic. It's very organic. It's very, it's very complex. There's so many factors involved in that, that you can't necessarily control it in the way that you can with direct response marketing, um, which is really, really interesting to be even saying that coming from the background that I do, but I guess I've just experienced the, uh, I guess I've seen the light. I don't want to be a direct response guy anymore. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't. I, I think I don't want to treat people like data. I don't want to like measure the people coming into my world. Like what's the conversion rate on my email list? Like, no, I just want to make friends, make cool shit, make a living from it, not be too anal about it. It sounds like you're still, if I'm hearing this right, that you're still sort of guided by giving someone sort of practical instructions for how to do the a thousand true fans thing, but there's been a shift from like, maybe, uh, yeah, like an, a mechanical approach, as you said, of like follow these steps to like more like be yourself on the internet and have fun. And then that will attract the people that are uh, the right people to be engaging with what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a very clear sort of summation of it. And it's interesting that there is, I used to be very prescriptive in how I taught these things is like, um, you know, I had a series of tools and like, here's how you do, here's like, here's the process for finding a niche or, um, you know, finding a, a small subculture or sub segment of the market that you can serve. Here's the research process. Here's how you document everything. Here's how to think about creating content. Here's how to yada, 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 all the way on down the line to, to selling. Like it was very mechanistic, very prescriptive very direct. Um, and it came from this, you know, this place of wanting to control things. Um, and what I'm realizing now is that in this, like when, when playfulness and creativity and being yourself and vibing and whatever all these words are like, there's, there's no playbook for any of that. Um, so it, it's interesting that I am still trying to teach. I am still trying to create some even the word systems doesn't necessarily feel right. Um, re I think recipes might be a better, a better metaphor is like, I'm, I think I'm more concerned with people building things that feel deeply resonant and fun and enriching to them. And what feels enriching to them is probably going to be something completely different than what enriches my life and what delights me day to day. So for one, there's an element of just giving people permission to go off the beaten path and not follow all the marketing best practices and not build their business into a mirror image of what they see a whole bunch of other YouTubers or writers or whoever doing. Um, but just to, to build from this, this first principle of build something that feels good to you. Craft your business in such a way that you enjoy being in it day to day. Um, Cause that was a, that was a lesson for my first business too, is I just, 
did a lot of things that I saw other people doing that I assumed this is how business is done. So I'll do that too. Then I didn't enjoy it, but I was stuck in an abusive relationship with it. Cause like, that's how I thought things had to be done. But mm. this whole year it's been like, Oh, I don't have to follow any of that advice that drains me. I'm just going to dick around and experiment and find other ways to accomplish the same things that I find, you know, rewarding for, for their own sake. So that's one piece of it. The other is, um, is what I'm tentatively calling inside out business, which is really just this, like it's, it's about sort of like deeply introspecting and understanding both your, like the various facets of yourself, your, your values, your worldview, all of these, these things that for lack of a, like should be the foundation of a, of a business that you enjoy running, right? You, cause you know, you have to serve other people. You have to create things in the world to get attention, but what you create should be a reflection of yourself. And I, like, I think this was true for me as I just, I didn't necessarily know myself until the last year or two. Um, and the more I knew myself, the more I was able to find the type of people that I wanted to serve. The more I knew myself, the less I, yeah, the less I got in my own way, the less I, um, I don't know, just relied on other people's answers for how things should be. And the more I was able to trust that what I was doing was the right path for me, even if it looked nothing like what everyone else was doing. So that's kind of the first step for me is, is starting from a place of introspection, understanding your worldview, your values, and then using that as sort of the raw ingredients for whatever these recipes are that I, that I create. Um, does that make sense? Is that, a, is that a cogent way of explaining what I'm up to? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think part of the reason I have a basis to understand it is sort of my own journey with these things. And then also seeing people that you've worked with or just other people doing this online. And like, it just, it makes a lot of sense to me. I, um, yeah, I, I would be curious to hear, I know there's some specific things that you've talked about that, you know, uh, maybe I read about when I first read your material and, you know, I imagine that how you think about them may have shifted with this kind of uh, larger perspective shift that you're talking about, but uh, I'd be curious to hear about them and you can share whatever you like about like, oh, I, I don't even think about it that way anymore, but um, maybe we can kind of run through some of these recipes, as you say, and see what you yeah. think about them. Um, so I know one of the things that you've talked about is, uh, niches and you know it seems like you used to have a pretty strong perspective on that and maybe that's changed but what would you say about niches now and, and mm. the role of those in being an online creator oh man that's a big question tasha <laughs> okay so i think the first step here is just to to explain what i mean when i say niches because one of the things that has endlessly frustrated me especially this year is that the word is so slippery and it means different things to different people. A lot of like, a lot of people just mean it as like a catch all term for a personal brand. A lot of people mean it as a, as a, as a, like a term of art for how you position or how you differentiate yourself. Some like there's, there's so many different concepts that seem to just get wrapped up in this idea of, of you know, finding an itch, creating an itch that have kind of made it, um, I don't know, like I, regardless of whether I still believed in the underlying concept, um, it was just kind of sick of it. It was another one of those, I'm sick of trying to change people's minds. I'm sick of trying to explain, explain what I mean to people all the time. Um, mm -hmm. But my general definition of a niche is just a, a subculture or a, or a, you know, a small segment of the market, a group of people who congregate around a shared identity, a shared problem. Um, and the, you know, the ecosystem of, you know, internet stuff that forms around that, whether it's blogs or YouTube channels or communities or discord servers or whatever. Um, the, the internet, the, I don't know, man, like there, there are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of these little subcultures online, most of which are completely illegible that we'll never see. 
their their dark forests is the I don't know who came up with that, um, but they they just like hide away and they're they're uniquely for those specific types of people who identify with them. So that's generally what I mean when I say like niche. So when I would tell somebody to find a niche, I would say like understand yourself, do that sort of introspective work, so that you can go find a corner of the internet that is uniquely suited to you, that you can do creative work there, that you can, yeah, that you can just like build your own business away from a lot of like the mass market mainstream, whatever that, I don't know, personally, I find soul sucking and annoying and whatever. So that's the foundation for this. And I think it's interesting. Like, I still agree with what I just said is like, introspect so that you can find people like you to serve and create stuff for. I think the hard break that I've had this year, and this is, this came from like following all my own niche advice is like going through my very prescriptive processes, um, only to come out the other end, not quite where I tell other people they should, <laughs> which is an interesting thing is like eating your, I don't know, dog fooding, eating your own, whatever only to realize that it's, uh, I don't know, this is an interesting thing. But the thing that I realized is that I, the work I'm doing doesn't fit in any one market, any one subculture, or, or pertain to any one group. Um, you know, there, there are writers, there are YouTubers, there are podcasters, there are people who, who just dick around on Twitter, who wouldn't really consider themselves, you know, like business owners or creators, but who are still sort of like playing the same game. Um, you know, and that's musicians and filmmakers, like all of these are technically niches. But what I've, I've realized is that I'm not necessarily looking to embed myself in any one of these communities, as my previous prescriptive advice would have been. Instead, I, I want to find those small handful of people from, from all over who, for lack of a better word, vibe with what I'm up to, who share my worldview, who, who are, yeah, who are tired a lot of the, the traditional marketing advice, the traditional advice around how to build a creator business, and who, who want to do weirder, more vibrant more niche work on the internet and make a, make a living with it. And who don't want to be, you know, marketers or direct response marketers, but just who want to be friendly and kind and generous. Um, and that's a, that's an interesting thing is like realizing that there is no one place for me to exist as I had previously thought of myself doing. Um, and now I'm, yeah, like, this is the interesting thing is like, I think previous me would still do this like top down thing. It's like, okay, how can I, how can I identify all the communities that I want to be part of? And like, how can I, how can I like reach into all of them in very strategic ways? And now I'm for lack of a better way of putting it, just sort of surrendering, not, not trying to solve this as a puzzle, but instead vibing my way through the world, making friends, trusting that in due time, I will reach people in some of these disparate communities, just on account of, you know, word of mouth and people, you know, my work spreading in ways that are completely uncontrollable, that are just an emergent property of me showing up and doing what I do best. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Like there, I am still very, very niche in a certain way. I exist for a very like a relatively small group of people who are playing the creator game, whatever that means. Um, but those people are all over the place, man. They don't exist in any one community and any one subculture. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of resigned, I guess, to, you know, being as strategic as I, uh, as I can be. And uh, broadly speaking, just letting it, letting it go and surrendering. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I love that. Um... I'd be curious, I, I, you know, two of the sort of prescriptions of sorts that you you made at the time that I, you know, I've actually found pretty useful are uh, making a market map and an audience map. That's that's are your terms, and uh, I'd be curious, could could you describe what those are and whether you'd still see those as being useful or how they'd fit in now? Yeah, yeah. So 
a market map is, I've had like five different terms for this, so it might be referred to as something else in other places, mm -hmm. but a market, a market map is essentially like a, just a, a spreadsheet of all of the players in any various space. So I, I usually, in the old, good old days, um, bad old days, I don't know, the old days, um, would have people do niche research, I, you know, find, you know, like Google some keywords that are related to the topics and ideas that you care about, you know, follow those rabbit holes down Google, down Facebook, down YouTube, document the, you know, the blogs, the podcasts, the YouTubes, the influencers as a word that I just, I don't know, it's a terrible word. <laughs> um, the basically everything and anything pertaining to that space so that you have it all in one spot. Um, and they're like, I don't know, I, I have a pretty sweet notion template that is, is probably floating around out there that is, um, I don't know, there's just a lot of things that you can do with it, whether you wanna use it as like, a, um, like the basis for a CRM so that you can start reaching out to these people, um, whether you wanna use it as a, as, like the basis for a, a content promotion system. Like I had a, a notion template for that as well, where there's a couple different notion databases talking to each other. So it's like, show me all of the communities that are related to X or all of the Facebook groups that are related to X. And then you could, you know, go visit those places and share your content and whatever else. Um, so there's a lot of cool things that you can do with that initial, very tedious research that make the process of building a niche business a lot easier and give you just a, a clear map of, you know, like whether for, you know, for one, whether there actually is a niche here, whether there's a vibrant, thriving subculture, how big it is, how many different types of players. Um, and yeah, just like all of these things that are very useful to know if you're trying to build a business. And also, you know, like, how are other people talking about these topics? How can you position yourself against them? How can you like, it's, um, it is deeply, deeply useful. And um, I don't know, like, it, it's interesting. I can't discount anything that I did in the past because it unequivocally worked. It just, it just doesn't seem to fit where I'm at now and how I want to show up in the world and how I want to spend my my time. You know, it, it's a very, it's a very top down approach. It's very much about having control, having certainty, having, um, yeah, it is really about creating a sense of certainty is, is the way I would put it. And I think it, maybe a little context here is that coming from the filmmaking world, that was almost a prerequisite because films are wildly expensive to create. They take a ton of time and then you end up selling them for like eight bucks on iTunes or some shit. It's like the most economically nonsensical <laughs> thing that you could do. So you really had to have a sense of, is there a market for this? Who are the, like, what are the various vectors that I can get into that market and yada, yada, yada. Like for that particular context that I was operating in for so long, all of this kind of stuff was essential. Taking this bottom up, I'm just going to wing it and surrender to the universe approach in the film world is probably very dumb. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's a market map. It's just basically like a, a notion database or a, or a, you know, like a Google sheet or whatever, where you document everything that you find around um, a certain topic. An audience map, on the other hand, is, I would call it a, a, a psychographic exploration of the people in your niche where so maybe it maybe a better a market map is about seeing this space from like the 20,000 foot view looking down whereas an audience map is about the people and how they think and how they feel and what they care about and really what this is about is a, a different type of research where you get in the weeds you listen to people maybe you have conversations it's really about understanding the internal it's a it's a document that helps you understand and map the internal world of the people in the space that you're going into so what are their 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 heartfelt desires what are the things that keep them up at night what is the insider lingo or jargon that they use in this space that wouldn't make sense in any other context um, broadly, broadly speaking, like who, 
who do they want to be? Where do they, like, who do they stand against? Like, who are the, the enemies and the internal narratives? And you can, you can keep drilling down in all sorts of interesting ways here. But really, it's just about understanding the people you serve, not as a demographic. So not as like, this is like, like white guys age 21 to 35. It's like, no, who, who really are these people from the inside out? Like, what do they, what do they care about? What's their emotional landscape look like? Because that's the kind of stuff that unlocks basically everything you want as a as an intentional business builder or an intentional marketer like that like that's where all the answers are for what kind of content should i create that will actually get people's attention and get them to actually give a shit rather than just like scroll by it on their twitter feed or whatever that's how you determine like if you're building products like oh people really seem to struggle with such and such and there aren't really good existing solutions out there that would be a great place for me to dig in and build a build a course offer a coaching service offer whatever it's essential for writing things like sales copy cuz you know it's you know at the end of the day like the old copywriting and marketing maxim is that people buy things for emotional reasons but use their smart thinky brains to come up with like great logical sounding reasons for why but it's a deeply intuitive and emotional process is making that decision and if you have this this document that has basically charted out everything that your people care about and what keeps them up at night and what their desires are and etc like all of that is already there for you like you have all of the answers to be able to communicate effectively and resonantly and um it's my god cat hey get down i'm gonna spray you i'm gonna spray you no he doesn't care um but yeah that's a that's an audience map it's just this this it's about you know the internal world and just getting it all down on paper and and basically researching like you have to immerse yourself in this world and observe how people are in their natural online habitats and have conversations to find this info so it's something that you sort of build over time um but it's a very, 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 very useful thing. Would you still recommend those tools or? Uh... Yeah, I think, I think for some people I would. Um, and it's, it's one of those things like if, if certainty and having control is, is a top priority for you, I know of no better ways, like, especially if you're doing, like you're trying to build a business, you're trying to do things that work like, reliably um hold on i gotta get this cat down it's like knocking books off my bookshelf and doesn't like it that i'm talking to somebody besides him mm -hmm. won't allow it <laughs> um but yeah these are good tools for people who who want certainty around around their actions and how they spend their time their tool like if they're also really great for speaking directly to a specific niche because they're really that's what they're designed for is like you have a very clear idea of who you're talking to where they exist etc cetera, etc cetera. um but yeah it's it's just interesting that i don't think that i would use them at this stage in my journey just on account of how much i've basically surrendered control how much i'm just trying to show up in ways that I think are, are fun and fulfilling on their own and playful on their own. Um, and yeah, I don't know, man. Like, I think it, it's one of those things that's gonna change from context to context, but I, like, I believe heartily that the tools are valid, the tools are useful, the tools do exactly what it says on the tin and can lead you to yeah, they can also lead to building like a really vibrant, meaningful business. Like there, it's not, it's not like I am dis like distancing myself from these things now. Um, it just doesn't feel like how I want to be spending my time, just like meticulously documenting things that people say. Mm -hmm. It's like no, I'd, I'll just show up and shit post on Twitter and generally give fewer fucks and. Eh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in the context that I use them, uh, James and I 
use them for the digital productivity coach that we created. And it wasn't so much that we needed certainty there, but I think it was just like, I've been thinking about, as you talk about like Boyd's OODA loops, and it seems like it gives you like good information to orient on, and it's not necessarily mm -hmm. going to produce the certainty you're going to talk about or like a definite next step every time, but it's just like good information to be aware of if you're in the creator space. Yeah, no, that's a, and that's a good way. Cause I, it's interesting. Like I know that I, like there is no such thing as certainty, like ever, like even, even when you've um, like done all this work and, and followed all these very prescriptive processes, like there's, there's just no such thing as, as certainty in any context. Um, maybe, and maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe that's a better, a better framing of it is, is de-risking. Mm -hmm. um, and especially in this, the, like in the context of filmmaking, like I was talking about before, like it's, it's really important to de-risk one of these projects where you're going to spend a year or two creating the thing um and you want to make sure that there are people there who are going to want it and there's like channels that you can spread it through um but yeah ultimately it's just about being able to move through the world with a you know somewhat of a sense of confidence that they're they're like the puzzle pieces are going to fit together for you in a way mm -hmm. that that makes sense logically i think mm -hmm. definitely one of the other sort of, I, I don't know if you coined this term or just borrowed it, but like one of the other terms you talk about is having an oasis. Uh, can you define what that is and how that yeah. fits into the picture? I think I might have coined this one. Mm -hmm. um, for me, an oasis, like it, it, you can obviously be like very literal in terms of like, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a refuge from a hostile environment. Um, it's a place of, of sanctuary in an otherwise like brutal world. <laughs> um, and increasingly, like that's how I've come to see a lot of the internet is just a, just kind of a desert, like culturally and, you know, full of, uh, I don't know. It, it's interesting. Like I, I'm trying to like throw less shade at um, shady marketers because, you know, they're people who are doing their best and, and whatever. Um, but broadly speaking, like a lot of the internet is just full of, of really shitty, aggressive direct response marketing, a lot of, a lot of snake oil, especially the corners that I've been traveling in, which is people teaching business in one context or people teaching marketing. There, there's so many big promises that are never lived up to so many best practices that when followed are both not fulfilling for the vast majority of people, but also lead them to doing just kind of mediocre half-baked work because that's what they think will will work or produce the outcome thereafter and it it's led to vast swaths of the the internet corners that i am traveling in to feeling again just kind of like a desert kind of lifeless kind of bland very boring so <clears throat> the idea of an oasis for me is again to create a refuge from that a place where those weird few who who see things the way that i do or whoever else can come and feel safe and have fun and find a whole bunch of like really interesting, vibrant rabbit holes to go down that are weird and delightful and nerdy. Um, but really it's about building a world that is both delightful for you to spend your time in and delightful for a specific subset of the people that you wanna serve or for the people that you wanna serve. Um, and really that's, that's it. It's just about building something that is radically delightful, especially if it is like contradictory, I guess, to everything that surrounds in the space. Like, I think that's, that's the thing is it's about creating contrast from everything else that's around that will really make a small subset of people very, very happy, even if it's polarizing to other people. What would, what would that look like? What would a concrete example of that be? Or could you just help me sort of mm. visualize what that might look like? Yeah. So, I mean, for one, I think Ungated is an oasis for mm -hmm. a very specific type of online business creator person um, who is sick of a lot of the traditional advice. And I, I have tended to focus on like more intermediate to advanced creators or online business people who've been through a lot of the traditional ways of doing things and found that they don't resonate, they don't work, and they're looking for something that is that is more resonant. They want to show up in the world. They want to matter. They want to serve. They don't want to follow like the six step blueprint to, you know, go live on a beach in 
only touch your laptop for four hours a month or whatever. Um, so it's for people who just want to like show up and do work that matters um, for an audience that cares. Another example, like I think one of the like the guys who really crystallized this, um, Craig Maud. There we go. Um, but so this guy has built a little world that is uniquely his own that nobody else could ever reproduce because it's the perfect synthesis of all the weird shit that he's interested in. Primarily, he takes extremely long walks of you know two, three weeks, maybe a month or more around Japan, visiting all this the small cities, like writing about you know his travels and the people he meets, doing a lot of high quality photography. Um, he made a, a book, I think it's called like Kissa by Kissa or something, but it's about these small little Japanese restaurants and like their dishes. Um, he writes really beautifully about, about culture in all sorts of ways. And it's just like, it's, it's something that is so singular and for the right type of person is so, like th there's just nothing else like it. When you encounter it, like and there's, there's like layers to this thing, right? There, he has like a bunch of different newsletters, different types of ways that you can engage and interact with him. And it creates this feeling of, I don't know, like you can just tell that he's not following any playbook besides his own. You can tell that he's not doing this for any other reason other than the sheer love of all of these, these kind of disparate and strange topics, but it creates an experience that as a, as a consumer is, is deeply compelling and magnetic. And honestly, like, I don't know. It's one of those things that just like gives me hope for what the internet could be. It's like, it's, it's people building these little worlds that are, are just like, where they leave artifacts of their nerdiness and they just go down all of these rabbit holes that really pull them. And I don't know, like, it, I think that that maybe is like the example that stands out most of an oasis is just this, the bizarre, wonderful, delightful little world of Craig Maud. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. What would, what would, uh, if someone was going to create an oasis of their own, what would that look like? Like, uh, like a blog or a website or what is, what does it look like? Yeah, well, I, so I made a, a course about this that has mm -hmm. basically, and again, it's, it's a recipe, it's not a, it's, and you can mix and match ingredients, you can do it all. But fundamentally, like there are, I, I'd say like two primary things that you can pull on, one of which is the, just like following your intellectual curiosity to its extremes, um, not watering it down, but really just going deep, getting weird, being nerdy, and creating work that is likely going to be off-putting to, you know, a lot of the internet randos who stum stumble across it, but for, you know, one out of a hundred, five out of a hundred, it doesn't really matter. They are just going to be thrilled to death that somebody else is as nerdy about this as they are. The other thing is basically like harnessing an awareness of the things that annoy people in your space is understanding all of the, you know, all of the best practices, all of the things that other people are doing that they rub everybody the wrong way, but because everybody does them, nobody really speaks up. There's just an assumption that like, this is the way things have to be and doing the opposite. Like, so I don't know, this is one of those things for me is like, I never, like, it was just Black Friday, like a week ago. And like, I have never and will never run a Black Friday sale. And I will never, um, you know, do like, I don't know, like, that's the thing is like, it's one of those things where I will come out and say that. And I'll say like, here's why I don't want to protect your inbox. I want to be a, a place of sanity and not like, like, just contribute to this, this feeding frenzy that happens across these days. Um, and another example is like, I, I just don't run sales period anymore. Like, I think I ran my last one about a year ago or maybe a little bit more. Um, and it's one of those things that like now just like, I have things for sale. People can do a scholarship with me if they want, like can't afford something. Like I will happily just give anybody anything that I have, but 
broadly speaking, like I just, I don't want to create those types of emotional triggers in people, which are extraordinarily effective for driving sales, for generating revenue, but that ultimately leave a lot of people feeling like their brain just got hijacked. Um, and it starts from a principle of like, if somebody wants to, to pay me in any context, I want it to be because they genuinely want to pay me because they vibe with me because they really want the thing that I'm offering. Not because there's some flashing countdown timer that's like, you have 30 minutes until your 50% discount goes away forever. And it's all a big sham. Like there's just never going to be anything like that in my world anymore. And not only do I act that way, but I also call it out. Like I explicitly call out all of the dumb bullshit that I see in the marketing space that, um, I don't know, like it, it's one of those things that like a lot of people are thinking it, a lot of people are annoyed by these things. Um, but when somebody comes along and puts words to it and is like, yes, that is annoying. That is garbage. That is not a nice way to treat other human beings. Um, it deepens that bond that I have with those people or who see it the way that I do. And it pulls them deeper into my world and, and creates a sense of, of trust that is basically the foundation for everything I do is, is just creating trust with people and these long-term reciprocal relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like these are, uh, just coming back to what Noesis is, if, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, it sounds like it's sort of like a place on the internet that is your home, that has your content about the things you're interested in, presented in the ways that you brings you delight and isn't necessarily bound by the norms that other websites might have about their content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, hi, Kat. Um, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be one website. It can be this loose collection of disparate channels and places. And like, it's, it's interesting, right? It's like, I, I increasingly think of like everything I do is just kind of one oasis. Like we might talk about Citizen Within at some point too, mm -hmm. which is another website I run. Mm -hmm. um, like that in and of itself is kind of an oasis for a, per, a person of certain political persuasions, I would say, or certain it's just like a certain sense of exhaustedness about political discourse. Mm -hmm. Like that's meant to be a place of, of refuge from all the dumb culture war bullshit that makes politics so exhausting and terrible. Um, so I don't, but I don't know. It's like, there's, there's different pieces and there's different layers of the ungated world. Like you might encounter me through Twitter initially and be like, I don't know, maybe it's like, oh, this guy's very irreverent or whatever. I don't know what people think of me on Twitter or even what I think of myself on Twitter anymore. It's a very strange place. Um, you know, they come to the website, and like that's a whole world, but then there's a community, there's, there's courses, there's coaching, there's like all of these like layers of, a, of an onion that all contribute and that all sort of deepen the experience. Um, and that maybe that's a different thing than the Oasis concept. Maybe I'm mixing and matching too much, but yeah, I think I think this I, like the idea for me is just it's a it's about building a world, and there can be different aspects of it. There can be different, um, or it could even be it could even be multiple worlds. Like Michael Ashcroft, right? Is he's got his his sort of like Alexander Technique blog and whatever, but he's also got his own, and they're they're loosely connected. They're kind of permeable, but like they're they're just and I think he calls them like different gardens in his oasis like there's so many different metaphors that we use for these things but um yeah i don't know if that clarifies anything it's basically there are no rules other than do what you think is really cool and don't do what everybody else is doing especially the annoying things that nobody likes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's a good good definition for it I know one of the other courses that you created recently is uh, something you call Stand Out and Connect. What is that course about? So broadly speaking, this course does what it says on the tin. It helps people stand out in relatively competitive spaces. So, you know, like for you and James, like the productivity space is a nightmare. There's so many people competing and doing different things. So 
one of the things that the course would help you do is, is again, create that contrast between yourselves and what you're doing with the, the digital productivity coach and what everybody else in the productivity world is doing. So contrasting is one piece of it. The other is connection. It's about building emotional connection with the people you seek to serve, to use like some Seth Godin language. Um, the main process or tool or strategy or whatever that I teach in that course is something that I developed called fascination stacking. And this is gonna require a little bit of explanation as to what the hell this thing actually is, but I hope it makes sense. So I think about this idea of what a, a fascination is, like a singular fascination. I think of it as a, and a, a point of emotional resonance, like an idea that you talk about or a way that you show up, something about you, something about what you talk about that deeply resonates with the people that you seek to serve. Like, and that's, that's a big thing. It's like understanding who it is that you're going after and then, um, you know, finding these, these fascinations, these points of resonance. Fascination stacking is stacking a whole bunch of these fucking things on top of each other, right? Is it's this bottom up process. And that like, this is where I think it's actually very, very, I don't know if revolutionary is the right word, but if you spent time thinking about positioning and branding and differentiation, so much of this stuff is, is top down. It's about, we're going to create this brilliant strategy to separate ourselves from all the competitors and build a blue ocean, and yada, yada, yada. Um, my general take is that you can't think your way into a differentiated resonant brand, but you can, you can build your way into it over time by interacting with your market, creating things, seeing what actually connects with people versus what you think will, because very often... Those are very different things. You'll put something random out into the world that you, for, I don't know, is you just being like, eh, it's a thing that I'm putting out that will really strike a nerve and get people talking versus this thing that you spend like two weeks just like meticulously crafting because you're so sure that it's going to connect with people. And then it's just crickets. Like that's pretty common to the creator experience, no matter what you're doing. Um, so it's really about building or maybe even like weaving together a tapestry of fascinations over time, all of which um, will lead to you being like, like people encountering your brand, you will feel different. Like that's the thing is like, you might not look different necessarily, but if they encounter your content and they are the right type of person that you're trying to attract, you'll be magnetic in a way that really nobody else is because nobody else is building on these, these signals over time. And I don't know that I did a lot of justice to the idea, but there's uh, like, there's a bunch of other stuff in the course in terms of like how you find these, like how you extract them from yourself. Again, like that, that interest, like that introspection, there's talk about market research, how to, how to build on what your competitors are already doing well and how to position yourself against them. <laughs> There's, um, and then there's also um, just ongoing market research in terms of, um, you know, talking to people and being an observer in your niche. So it's a lot of the same stuff we were talking about before in, in terms of audience mapping. Um, but yeah, it's all, it's all deeply bottom up at this point. It's all about understanding the different things that tend to resonate with people and, and just weaving, yeah, again, weaving together a tapestry of ones that make perfect sense for you that nobody else in the world is going to be able to replicate. Hmm. And yeah, it's pretty dope, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, it, so it's, it's sort of, of the content you created, it's been more reflective of this sort of bottom-up approach that uh, reflects the shift in thinking that you've had over the year. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd say... That's, that's one of the big ones is, um, is just realizing that my, and again, it comes back to, to surrendering and letting go of the need to control things and just following intuition, seeing where it takes you, seeing how you feel as you do these things. Cause I did the top down thing for so long and it just never worked for me. It never led to me feeling like I want to feel in the world and living my life in a way that I think is, is fulfilling. Mm -hmm. But if the last year has taught me anything, it's that, yeah, it's that 
building a business can feel good. It can be fun. It can be playful. It can be increasingly enriching over time as you keep experimenting and iterating and learning and, and all of these things. But when you, you know, try to plan your way into that, it very, very rarely, if ever, like it's never turned out well for me when I try to plan my way into that. But when I give up the need to control it and just sort of experiment and iterate and, and learn and grow and, and, you know, test all of these assumptions and learn that they're wrong and then try something else. Like it leads me to places that are way more delightful and way more resonant than anything that I would be able to plan my way into. Totally. Totally. I know one of the projects you've worked on recently has been uh, sort of interviewing Michael Ashcroft and working with him mm. to kind of uh, understand what's been happening with his business. And, you know, I was lucky to have Michael on the podcast recently and have, you know, really benefited personally from his, his course. And I love what he's doing. And I'd be curious to hear from you kind of what, uh, what you were seeing in the way that he runs his business that made you want to focus on his work in particular and what you've learned from working with him. Yeah. So I'm just going to come right out and say that Michael has been um, <clears throat> maybe instrumental is the right word in like whatever the hell this, this internal emotional transformation that's been happening over the course of 2021. Um, I hired him a coach back in, I don't know, back in February or March of this year. And we've been working together ever since. And I'd say since like maybe May, I've also been working with him on his business. Um, the thing that attracted me to him initially, other like, I don't know, I followed him on Twitter cause he's, he's really just like funny and weird and goofy on Twitter um, was just the, the uncanny success of the Alexander Technique course, it, like coming from a, a traditional marketing background where like I think in terms of funnels and launches and all these crazy things, to see somebody like Michael come along with this wildly esoteric course about a topic that nobody knows really anything about. Um, and I have some theories about why it's so attractive is like the, the fact that that it is so mysterious, I think creates this, um, this tension that people just have to find out like what all the fuss is about and like what's going on there. So that's something mm. interesting that I think Michael is channeling is just like the, the illegibility of, uh, of Alexander technique. And the fact that it is so, so hard to put into words creates this, this um, almost unbearable sense of curiosity. Like that's what it was for me in the beginning is like, what the hell is this thing? I know that I'm, I'm, I like the benefits that he talks about and the various things that it can do, but what is it? <laughs> um, so I think I got a little off track there, but essentially coming from my very mechanistic marketing background and seeing this goofy guy with an esoteric course selling an insane amount just by shit posting on Twitter and mentioning it briefly in his Substack newsletter was kind of eye-opening to me. Because frankly, he probably made more just in, in 2021 with this course than I did in my first like two to three years of running an online business by not really trying that hard. And that's, I think that's underselling Michael because I know he did a lot of work to like interview people and like lay the foundation and he ran some workshops around Alexander technique beforehand to like figure out how you could teach this thing that is traditionally taught in person, how to move that online. Like he did a lot, a lot of work, but from like a marketing perspective and a, how do you sell this perspective? Um, he did basically none of all of the things that I thought were a given for online business. Like he didn't have a, a I don't even think he had a sales page for the vast majority of it. It was just like a, like here's a here's an email that links to the course in Podia where you buy it or whatever. Um, and I think the big oh shit realization for me was one, a, I don't know if envy is the right word, but seeing this guy who's just clearly having a ton of fun and being himself and making something that was radically unique, like there's nothing else like it on the internet. And then being successful because he has, like he's, he's got just a great re reputation for being friendly and kind and generous and whatever online. Um, it sort of snapped me out of my mechanistic mode of thinking 
Like that was one of the things that, that really sort of did it for me earlier in the year. It was like, holy shit, if he's able to do this, what else is possible? Um, yeah, I actually don't know if I have more to the, that answer, but like that was, that was the thing, right? Is I was just sort of like awestruck by, by his, his uncanny ability to sell this course without doing any of the traditional marketing stuff that it, it just got me curious and it got me, I don't know, it got my brain sort of working to understand why he was able to do it. And the more I started picking apart that question, it was like, oh, this is, this is in fact replicable. Michael's not some Superman. Like he's, he's like, it really does come down to being friendly and kind and prolific and making a lot of friends and doing, doing weird, deep work. Like that's, that's the thing is like, he's, he's really qualified to teach these things. And on account of his reputation, on account of like who he is and how he's shown up in the world and probably on account of him not being a sleazy marketer, um, he's been wildly successful on account of all those things. So yeah, I'd say that that's probably like my, my introduction to Michael and where all of this sort of started. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, both that he'd uh, sort of be a surprising counterexample for you and also that you could kind of reverse engineer what kind of worked for him. And uh, yeah, is there any like, you know, when you're working with people as a, as a sort of marketing coach, is there any advice that you find yourself giving people mm -hmm. repeatedly? Increasingly, it's, it's follow your intuition and see how it goes. Mm. Now that I'm, <laughs> um, yeah, it, like let go of expectations, let go of the need to control this and just go try something that seems cool, that seems intuitively correct right now. And um, yeah, be open to different things that might happen when you do like that. And it's so, it's interesting. Cause I, again, coming from like the, the mechanistic prescriptive background like I used to have really precise bits of advice for people um, in basically any conceivable scenario that they might come to me with. But more and more, I'm realizing again that I want people to build something that looks nothing like what I'm building in the world, something that you know is reflective of their values, their worldview, their sense of creativity, their whatever. Um, and when I give hyper prescriptive advice, what I'm doing is imposing my worldview and my values on them. Um, and that no longer seems like a, gener like a generous thing to do or a, or a meaningful way to show up. Um, so it's, I think the thing that I keep coming back to in my coaching practice is giving people permission to do the things that they want to do. They have that, that sort of urge to do, but that the culture around them has convinced them that they shouldn't do for whatever reason. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of this, but yeah, none's, none's really coming to mind other than just like, like, I don't know, like there's a, there's a woman I talked to today who has this this rich academic background as like a PhD and has a you know has been doing things within this institutional context for all of her life and is starting I don't know going into like the feral free agent kind of thing now is like wanting to to be a like a, a bottom-up intellectual and just share things in this raw real fashion and and not be siloed in one little corner of the internet, but to start connecting all of her disparate interests across things. And like the culture she's been in, like that's, that's not how one operates in the world. And I feel like a big part of, of, you know, what, what we talked about is just like, you have permission to create a, a space that is a blank canvas and you have permission to treat it as a, as a place to follow your intuition wherever it leads you. Um, and you have permission to, to make a clean break from your past body of work and focus on what you really care about now. Um, and like, that's, it's crazy. Just like, and I don't know, like working with Michael, like the amount of things that he's given me permission to do that I already wanted to do, but somehow I was talking myself out of, but I just needed somebody else to give me permission because our brains are stupid. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's crazy. Like there, I think a lot of us are just waiting for permission 
for the to go after the things we want. Um, and for whatever reason, it's hard to get that permission from within. Like generally we only trust it when it comes from some external source. Mm. Yeah, the example that came to mind for me as you're talking is like, I, I mean, I don't know what it was like for him, of course, but I imagine that for Michael, like, you know, having trained in a physical environment to learn the Alexander technique that there wasn't anyone that was going to give him permission or the suggestion to be like, oh yeah, you could create an online version of this thing. And yet uh, the fact that he's done that has been, you know, such a, such a gift to the world, I think. And uh, yeah, to, to like give people permission to create the thing that they're thinking of, if it seems interesting or valuable, even if no one else has done it before, it seems really valuable. Yeah. And that's, and that's what it, like, it comes back to this theme of a lot of the internet is so boring. It's mm -hmm. full of the same types of people make, it's actually not the same types of people. It's just memes of what content should be that sort of like perpetuate themselves and get us all following these best practices. And we end up making like tweet threads that look like the next think boy tweet threads. And like, it's just, it's just the whole thing. But like, I, I kind of want ungated in some way to be that that pattern interrupt that gives people permission to be weird and be edgy and be um yeah to follow those those bits of themselves that that don't neatly map on to all of the the best practices and ways that everybody else is showing up because counterintuitively those are the things that will help them stand out those are the things that not only will they enjoy doing but will make other people gravitate towards them because they are they are unique, they are differentiated, and they are authentic in a way that so much content isn't. Um, and it's kind of it's kind of profound that all it takes is that little that little click of yes, you have permission to go be weird. Um, but I don't know. It feels like it's such a profound thing, um, especially when you play it out at scale and like, what does it look like to give a couple thousand permission people to be weird and what happens after five years of that like mm. like think of how delightful the the internet could be compared mm -hmm. to how it is now probably speaking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely um yeah there's a couple other sort of things with your work that i'd love to ask you about um mm -hmm. i know for a while you're trying to do a kind of gift economy experiment. And uh, if I recall correctly, you sort of shut that down. And I'd be curious to hear what you tried there and, and what you found. Yeah, this is a big one. I, this is one of the things that came, came about from just like a, a year of experimenting and being open and being like, fuck it, I'm just gonna try cool things. Um, I think I came across the gift economy idea maybe from the Stoa. Well, you probably know the Stoa. Mm -hmm. um, they do they do gift economy coaching sessions, and I sort of read up about it and was immediately captivated by the just by the concept. And I think I I don't remember how, but I stumbled into Charles Eisenstein's universe. He has a book called Sacred Economics that like there's a there's a whole lot of shit going on in that book that most of which is a, over my head, but like fundamentally one of his, the, like the core things he's aiming at there is, you know, transitioning from a market economy to, to gift economies at scale. Um, and it just, it just resonated this idea that we could offer our service, our services, our products, whatever it is that we do in the world in the spirit of a gift as something that we give of freely with no expectation of return um, knowing that it creates mutual, that it creates bonds, bonds of reciprocity with the people that we serve and that it, that it bonds us together in ways that are effective for long-term relationships and not just like one-off transactions where we're, we can just eff effectively be strangers. And like, there's, there's a lot of room for that. There's, or there's a lot of utility in that the world economy wouldn't be what it is without impersonal tra like transactions. Right. Um, but I was just sort of so captivated by this idea and it felt so just resonant right out of the gate that I was like, fuck it, I'm going to transition my entire business to this thing. Mm -hmm. And I did. I basically made all of my courses, um, all of my one-off coaching sessions, um, 
and basically everything else that I do available at on a on a choose your own price basis. Um, and I, you know, I set up some systems to, because I like I like this is one of those things I've known for a long time is that people generally speaking don't value free shit that they get on the internet. Like it's just it's just a, a true thing, um, generally speaking. So I tried to set up systems to basically like filter out people who aren't actually interested in the products or the work I'm doing. Um, so I had to, I don't know if you ever saw my fancy gift economy chatbot system thing mm -hmm. that I built. It's pretty goofy. Like it was like, it showed up like, hey friend, I am Robbot. I'm gonna mm -hmm. walk you through the gift economy <laughs> process. And it would, you know, you click a button, it would explain like what I'm doing and why I'm giving things away for free and et cetera. And it'd be like, what, which course are you interested in today? And if it was like, find your niche, it would then, you know, send you to a, a couple of forms that you would fill out. So it's like, what have you tried in the past um, for niching down, for identifying who you serve, for whatever. Um, but it was essentially qualitative research for me and getting people to think about the problem um, that this course would actually solve. And then, you know, another question might be, um, you know, what, what's the upside of finding your niche? Why is this important to you? What is this going to do for you um, to get people really thinking about why this matters? And then it would, you know, send them out to a, basically a, a checkout form with a pay your own price option or a, a, a pay the market price option, which I also had as well for people who just wanted to pay me something. So the thinking behind all of this was, I want to filter out people who aren't serious because um, I knew that offering free shit on the internet would attract a lot of unserious people. Like it's just sort of the nature of the thing. Um, and to really get people not only indoctrinated, I think that's the wrong word, but to like share the thinking behind this because it is a, a pretty radical model. Um, and then make them think about the actual products and problems that they solve or whatever before they actually get to the point where they can pay me or not pay me or whatever. So it was all really cool in theory. Like I built it out, like it all worked as it, as it should or whatever, but it took me, let's say five months, maybe four and a half to five months to completely shut this experiment down and go back to just putting things behind a paywall and the biggest reason is that it ended up with a lot of unserious people in my world, despite mm -hmm. my best efforts to filter them out. Like there, were, I don't know, there were a couple of times where somebody would tweet something that I had, or like tweet a link to one of my courses, I'd get a surge of like, you know, 30, 40, 50 signups. Um, very few people would pay on the front end, which is something I was expecting, but then I could go in and like, look at whether people were actually engaging or even whether they had actually signed up for the course or whether they had just gone through the checkout form and then like ignored the, uh, like, here's your stuff email that comes afterwards. Um, a lot of people hadn't even like clicked that and created an account in my mighty networks, whatever. Um, it is really dispiriting that I don't know. I think the thing that, that really struck me is that I had just like this intuitional sense that my business was becoming less enjoyable. I didn't, I felt, I felt less inclined to be in my community and to show up and to talk to people. I felt less inclined to create cool new stuff. I felt, um, just generally less excited to serve and show up and, and be there largely on account of the fact that the gift economy model for better or worse, um, led a lot of people into my world who, who didn't really want to be there, right? Like they, they saw the opportunity to get free shit around like how to market yourself as a creator, which, you know, there, I don't know. It, it's interesting. I'm trying not to serve that market, but event, like inevitably, like those are the types of people who, who ended up in my world. Um, and it, yeah, it just kind of sucked a lot of the joy out of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think the, the metaphor that I come back to is I want to fill maybe like my living room with a handful of really cool people who, who really get it and vibe and who are all trying to build businesses in a certain sense. And we're all 
you know, we're all working together and sharing what we learn. And there's this real sense of, yeah, camaraderie and like a, a mutual vision that we're all working towards and contributing to um, rather than a, a stadium full of like half interested people who are just kind of on their phones and they don't really care what's happening down on the field. They just, you know, they got a free ticket and they're there. Um, and that's what it was, that's what it was building towards the gift economy thing. Like, um, not something small and intimate and delightful that really, really like profoundly transforms a few people's lives and makes them more, more fulfilling and rad. Um, but yeah, the stadium full of indifferent people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the other nail in the coffin was realizing that there are those people who want the intimate experience out there who probably would find me through the gift economy, but on account of that being the experience and the community being full of a bunch of people who don't care and whatever, like the experience would be degraded for them. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was sort of like the nail in the coffin. It was like, this doesn't lead to a place that, that really does change people's lives, even if it would be economically viable over time as it starts to pick up momentum and whatever. And mm -hmm. I have no doubt that it would be. Like I was making maybe a little over a grand a month from, from this whole experience, um, which not too shabby for just giving shit away for free. Mm -hmm. And I barely marketed or promoted it or talked about it. Um, it was all word of mouth, so. That's fascinating. So, you know, I, it wasn't that it wasn't economically viable. It was more that like you weren't able to serve the people that you wanted to really help them the way that they needed and also enjoy it yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why, why is it uh, that people don't value something unless they pay a large enough amount for it? <sighs> That's the question, man. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. And like, I, I don't think it has to be money, right? But money is just the easiest way for people to put skin in the game and signal that they are committed to something. Um, but I think, I think that's, that's the question, right? Is like people, people don't value things that they're not committed to, that they like, they have no reason to actually show up and implement. Um, and the question is creators, I think is, like, especially like if you're trying to do something where you give things away for free and, and are getting people to value it, um, there needs to be something else there. Signs of commitment, signs of, um, or yeah, fi finding ways to get people to truly engage with it and make the commitment to it. Like, even if, if money isn't on the table, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the fundamental thing is it's, money is a sign of commitment. Although often it's not either. Oftentimes people just spend money because they want to feel good, even if they're not committed to something. Um, mm. That's another thing that happens. But yeah, I think, I think money is just sort of masking a deeper sort of emotional thing there. Um, mm. yeah. In my experience, it seems like it's really relevant whether someone has active goals related to the thing that they're learning about or not. So like, you know, um, for example, I, I don't know, I like you talked about guitar earlier and like, I think guitar is interesting, but I don't like, I, I would love theoretically to learn guitar, but like, I don't actively have the goal to learn guitar. So if someone offered me a free course on guitar stuff, I'd be like, that's cool. I might save that for later. But like, if I was actively trying to get better at guitar, that would be a lot more valuable to me. And it seems like money is a way of uh, maybe just filtering people that have that interest because they have an active goal or an active reason to want to learn about the thing or improve at the thing. Uh, but it's yeah. not like the money itself that is like the determining factor. Yeah. No, that tracks with me. I think, or maybe a yes and mm -hmm. to that point is, I'm, I'm slowly starting to um, disentangle my identity from being a guitarist because it's another one of those things like filmmaking that for a long time, I convinced myself that I should be really into mm -hmm. and that should be, um, I don't know, there was always a sense that I, it was just a should. It was, it was an expectation that I placed on myself based on who I used to be. Um, and I know that 
even though there was never really an active goal there, there was never really a sense of me like really like, okay, I'm going to make progress. I'm going to buckle down. I'm going to get good at guitar again. I'm going to fix my sense of shitty rhythm. Um, like I have a couple of rhythm courses. Like um, there is just enough of, of sort of an aspiration and a set of expectations in the background that led me to spending a lot of money on guitar courses and guitar shit. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting, like all of the different emotional factors that can lead to somebody making a purchase, especially when it's like, that's the thing that I'm, I'm trying to, to get better at sussing out is like, when is making a purchase for somebody going to be something transformative and meaningful in their life? Or how, how can we filter to get people purchasing things that will genuinely create a, a positive generative next step in whatever their journey is versus Ah, versus what I just described, which is, I won't say is wasting money, although I think it is like, is, is spending your resources because the, there's just some weird emotional baggage in your head that is convincing you of something. And it's probably interacting with some, some maybe manipulative marketing in the world. Um, that really knows how to pull on those insecurities or those old stories, even though, even though it doesn't necessarily fit with where you're trying to go or who you're trying to be. Um, and I don't know if that's a, a thing that's even worth thinking about, but it's one of those things that I've experienced so much and I've spent a lot of money over the years. Um, just out of a, a, from a place of insecurity, from a place of I'm not good enough, from a place of, yeah, from a place of like, this is who I think I should be based on who I used to be. Um, mm. So there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things to unpack there. And I, I don't know that you actually can filter any of this. Like mm -hmm. it seems, it seems like, you know, everybody has their own reasons for buying, um, mm -hmm. none of which are in your control as the person who's offering things for sale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. P part of what I'm hearing in that is like, yeah, goals might be part of it, but also like the emotion someone's feeling or their sense of identity of who they are and how all those things fit together. And yeah, that that's complex and hard to predict and like very, very idiosyncratic to who the specific person is. Yeah, when I think, I don't know, I think that comes back to this idea we've talked about a few times, which is mm -hmm. being less mechanistic being less prescriptive instead like i don't know i think a lot about this idea of just creating an an ecosystem of parts that fit together in various ways that people can interact with me people can pay me people cannot pay me but ultimately speaking what i what i want is for people to come into my world and find what they are looking for at any particular moment in their journey you know provided they're you know broadly aligned with the values and the way of showing up and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it's, it's interesting. Like that's, that for me is part of, of the Oasis idea, right? Is treating people as, as individuals instead of, um, you know, just maybe like cattle in a specific market or whatever. It's just like an undifferentiated mass who all act in the same way. It's like, no, I, everybody comes into the world through, in a different way everybody's looking for something slightly different um and i there's no way i can necessarily account for all of that but i can i can build an ecosystem that doesn't try to force my way of of thinking or my specific set of operating instructions down people's throats and instead treats them like individual autonomous unique adults with a sense of agency who will make who can be trusted to make the best choice for them mm -hmm. um, and actually that is, it brings me to another metaphor that I've been using a lot lately, which is um, I no longer create treasure maps to help people get what they want in life where you follow a specific set, you know, set of steps that leads to, you know, like gold at the end of the rainbow or whatever. But instead, like all of my, like everything in my world is a, is a compass. It's meant to kind of speak to your intuition in some way, the, to, 
help you know whether or not you're pointing yourself in the right direction for you. Um, so it's really about creating compasses that help people navigate a kind of wild, constantly changing, ever evolving world um, based on their values instead of mine. Mm. I think it comes back to permission, right? Giving people permission to go by their intuition to do those things that they want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That reminds me of like one of the reasons that I care about this issue of like why people don't value something that they don't pay for is like kind of a, a, a mix of values with uh, a lot of the kinds of things that I I'm interested in learning about and also about sharing in the world of like, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do is related to what you might call the Dharma or like spiritual teachings. And uh, there's a very strongly held value in, you know, Buddhism, for example, and a lot of spiritual traditions of this stuff should be free. It should be freely available. It should be widely available. I'm very sympathetic to that. And then also if people don't value it, if it's free, then like, how will they receive it or learn it. And so that's been um, kind of a tension for me over the years and different projects that I've been a part of, of like, well, on the one hand, there's a good value that this should be free. And on the other hand, if you don't put a price sticker on it, people aren't necessarily going to make use of it. And uh, I think one of the compromises that I've come to maybe in, in my own little oasis is like, I really like my blog posts and like these conversations and other things that I create to be uh, widely freely available. I like to put a Creative Commons license on them. For example, um, it's like, I wanna put the actual content out there for free, but then if I'm gonna uh, create, like like earlier this year, I taught a meditation course and mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure yet, but I think I'll probably teach that again next year. It's like, that's an experience around that content that like is more of like an accountability structure. It's more of a community. It's more of an interactive experience. And I want to, that I might like put a price sticker on and it's like all of the materials are still free. Like, you know, there's plenty of like loving kindness meditations that I put out or like my blog post on standing meditation, for example. But like, if you want an experience built around that stuff that we're like, you're actually going to have the accountability to uh, learn and apply the material then that is something that there'd be a price sticker on. And, and of course, I still want to have what vehicle I would use for this is not clear, but like, you know, I did this in the first version, but like having scholarships so that if someone wasn't able to pay for it, it's like that shouldn't be an obstacle. But, um, you know, for the people that are, it's like an accountability measure really to say, hey, I paid this money for the thing, like I'm going to do the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what I... I think what I keep coming back to around these questions, it's that there are no right answers. Mm. Um, and I, it's interesting. I've started getting into Zen lately. Um, there's a Zen center in LA that um, one of my friends is very, actually, she lives there. Um, and I've been, been sort of going to a lot of their Zoom meetings and they're doing Zazen and all of that, um, listening to the Dharma talks. Um, but what's interesting is I, I went and visited her in LA um, two weekends ago, maybe, um, and actually like sat at the Zen center and did a, like sat through a, a ceremony and did a like a longer like hour long zazen and talk on on Saturday, and there was something like really profound about one being there, and just like being in the space and with the people that has a it has a different energy, and yeah there, and I, I don't know exactly where i'm going with this other than like i immediately came home and was like i'm gonna pay these guys like 40 bucks a month on paypal from now on just because like i love it and i like i'm more committed to go to the actual zoom meetings and take them seriously and when i'm in la i'll go there but like i don't know i don't know exactly where i'm going with this other than like i appreciated that the the core experience was free, open to all. Like at the end, they obviously have their little, um, like this thing is run by donations. We have to keep the lights on. Like there's there's a little spiel, but yeah, it's, uh, I think I had to have the experience and actually feel what it was like to be there. Um, Cause I don't know, it's a, it's a different experience through Zoom. It feels like, um, which is obvious that it would be, but um yeah, I don't know exactly, but like that's, it feels like that's a, a model that can be replicated in different contexts is like 
giving people a meaningful experience and a hard, like a kind of hard experience. Like sitting zazen is is kind of tedious, especially the first few times, and like especially if you have shit posture, like I do. Um, like it's it's not a it's not a like a therapeutic type of meditation. Like I don't know, I, I learned TM, like transcendental meditation, earlier in the year, and it's very therapeutic. Just like sitting there repeating a mantra to yourself over and over again. Um, like this is a just like a much more in your face, um, like feel everything and see everything and be aware of everything type of thing. Like there's no running from it. And it's, but like having that kind of experience in, in like a communal setting with other people was just meaningful. Like, I don't know. And that's always something that's been true is like doing hard things with other people creates a, a sense of bonding and fulfillment that um, I don't know, is, is really kind of core to, to what we do as humans, but yeah, it's interesting how that might tie into, yeah, tie into economic models and what it looks like to be generous and what it looks like to also have healthy boundaries. Um, yeah, no right answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think generosity is a terrific model and it's a, it's a good one that, you know, it, it, there's a reason that that's been a basis of most of the Buddhist traditions that have existed. And, and I think, as you say, there's no like right answers and given all of the like options for how you can create product services offerings online, like there's a lot of variables you can have there. And like, uh, I don't know, it, it occurs to me that mm, something like, even though generosity has been the foundation of how a lot of these spiritual teachings are offered over the years, like uh, there's new forms that can arise given the current things that are available where it's, hey, this is still a generosity practice, both for the person giving and for the teacher organization receiving, but that it might look different in, in terms of how it's implemented or offered or what the container is. And I like, for example, um, something that I'm thinking of doing with this course I mentioned is like, if, if and when I offer it again, no, no guarantees, but um, is like, oh, there'll be a price, a sticker price, but then people on my Patreon who are giving basically from generosity could have a discount on it where it's like, you know, you get some percentage discount off of the course or something because of your generosity or something like that. Um, and, you know, I, I'd actually much, you know, on the other side, there's the variable of like, yeah, I have to eat and support myself and, and so on. Um, and from that end, I'd much rather have people supporting me on Patreon than paying like a one-time fee for a product, which which I would be happy to give away for free anyway, because I just want people to practice. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, the Patreon is like certainly better for me, but um, yeah, yeah, that's that's something I've thought a lot about because I think um, generosity is really important to me. Having having the teachings be freely and widely available is really important to me, and uh, I do want people to benefit from the things I put out there, and I want to support myself and make sure you know, I'm not worried about where I'm going to eat or where I'll stay or stuff like that. Uh, so that's a lot of different variables to take into account and there's no, no clear answers. And I've had to sort of carve my own path through how to, how to, uh, consider all these variables. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it's kind of a similar path to where I'm at now, which is like, I've been in, I, I don't know, say like stealth mode might be the right way of framing it is I've been kind of underground in 2021 just like trying a bunch of random shit in the background not really not really being too prolific but like a lot of things have been changing just you know emotionally speaking in terms mm -hmm. of like my approach to everything but it feels like yeah it feels like I'm sort of back to where I started which is like a thousand true fans mm -hmm. which is like I I think I'm back to just wanting to have a really simple straightforward membership um and i like this is one of the things that i'm doing now is um that i would i wasn't doing prior to the gift economy is like it's now available at a bunch of different price points like so you could support me at 50 bucks a year or 100 or like i have like stupid catchy names for them it's like true fan classic or true fan supreme or whatever mm -hmm. um but like they all come with the same benefits, you know, it's like all the courses I make and any like premium content that I put out on the website and like do some group coaching and things like that, which I need to get back to. I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just like having it available at different price points is like a sign of generosity is a, it's a different way to say like, 
yo, no matter what, I, I appreciate you. Um, no matter what, the value on the other end of this is probably going to be disproportionately more than whatever you pay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting how to, how to strike that, how to strike that balance. Um, and it, at this point, it's just an experiment, but I'm, I'm in the same boat as you is like, I, I've done the one-off product thing for the longest time. And I think I would rather just the, all of the information be free, but for the people who truly vibe, who want to support me, who want to have some cool stuff on the back end, like a lot of the longer form courses that I've put, put together, um, like it's all just bundled there. And I think the way I'm framing it is, you know, for people who are really committed to approaching business this way in this really playful, fun, authentic, whatever is like trying to figure out how to make that a signal of that commitment to living in that way. In addition to, you know, reciprocating whatever value I've created for them. So it's like, there's a lot of different things going on there. Um, yeah, like that's my thesis going forward. I'm going to be far more, far more prolific and also far more, um, like putting more things behind a paywall in 2022, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is interesting given that everything used to be free, but it's also just an experiment too, you know? Maybe, yeah. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go back to having everything be free, but you can support me if you want, but yeah and then one one advantage you have on your end is like um or just different variable is like i feel pretty strongly about like what i was talking about of things being freely and widely available for spiritual teachings but then like the digital productivity coach that i work on with james like i do want that information to be widely available but i don't have any problems like putting a price sticker on that and being like hey uh this is a product you should pay for because it, it's not fundamentally a spiritual teaching so um, you know, I think similar with stuff about marketing or like yeah. finding how to have your thousand true fans. Like that's something that's reasonable to, to charge for. There's not that same value there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, but there is still that voice in the back of my head that says this should be free. Mm -hmm. And what's hard to disentangle is whether or not that's the voice of generosity or the voice of imposter syndrome and insecurity. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was, this is a whole it was just like bundle of shit that I started disentangling um, after I made the switch to the gift economy <laughs> hmm. um, was how much of this was driven by like a, just like a resonant idea for an economic model that I think is beautiful and worthwhile and how much of it was driven by my shadow or driven by, uh, by my deep sense of discomfort around selling by my deep, I won't say deep sense of unworthiness, but like there's, there's, especially in my filmmaking business for so long, there was so much imposter syndrome on account of the fact that I was pulling away from the filmmaking community and wasn't making, like, didn't have the desire to make films myself anymore. That led to like some really, yeah, just, just really, really, really gnarly um, imposter syndrome, largely because I was like, that's the thing is it was true. <laughs> Um, I just didn't realize it for the longest time and I fought it, which just created more discord and um, lack of internal harmony or whatever. But yeah, like there's, um, I think there's a, a case to be made that a lot of my initial like actions around the gift economy stuff were me, I don't know, like, projecting my insecurity onto this this business model and thinking that it would that it would basically absolve me of the need to ever have to sell anything ever again um because fundamentally there was an idea that selling was icky that selling was unethical that which is clearly not true like it's one of those things i logically have always known is not true like you can sell something and be and like be acting in somebody else's best interest and in deep service to them like that's obvious to me, but there's always that part of myself that thinks like, I'm, I'm not good enough. Whatever I'm doing in the world is not, not worthy. Um, that it just felt so much safer to give it all away. Um, and hope that money would come back and like if mm -hmm. money did come back and people like, I, 
I don't know, like I never refund my courses. And when people actually take them seriously and do the work, they're like, holy shit, this is great. Like I have every reason to believe that what I'm doing is, is real and valuable and transformative. And like having seen other marketing courses out there and other online business things, like I know that I'm approaching it in a much different way that is, is resonant and useful and great, but there is still that emotional core in me that is just like petrified of asking for money. And it's, It'll be interesting to see what happens in the new year as I as I really start going harder on the membership. Um, Cause I suspect that a lot of the emotional changes that have been happening this year, as I sort of un I don't know, as I move from like a top top down to bottom up way of living, as I move from a, a sense of self-coercion and shame, which is kind of like my traditional way of motivating myself and getting myself anywhere. Um to being pretty deeply self-accepting. Like, I don't, I don't know what happened or how that changed, but there's, there's been a lot more, um, again, I think a lot of it is working with Michael. Some of it's the Alexander technique stuff. Um, some of it's just some straight up like Taoism, like Wu Wei stuff. Um, I don't know, man, but it'll be interesting to see how all of that, that sort of like internal transformation stuff plays out once I really start asking for money again, because my suspicion is that it's going to change things and that it's going to resolve a lot of that weird tension that's been there for years. Um, who knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes sense that there'd be a lot of like underlying sort of beliefs or emotions that sort of orient how you would approach these things. And yeah, I, I definitely have found your courses valuable when I've taken them. And, uh, you know, it's been really valuable for me and in the projects I've done. And also, yeah, I have similar emotional beliefs underlying the things that I'm doing. And uh, I think that's something that you get to confront through this kind of work creating online. It's like, oh, what, you know, you get to look, look really closely at that stuff. So, um, yeah. yeah, I'd love to hear... Um, a little bit about your, you know, you mentioned earlier the project Citizen Within. Can you speak a little bit mm -hmm. about what that project is and what you're trying to create there? So citizenwithin.com is another website that I run that is, for all intents and purposes, just a, a blog where I, broadly speaking, try to make sense of the of the political landscape and the turmoil. And I think a lot of it came out of um, out of the Trump years and seeing our entire media ecosystem devolve into chaos and seeing the the culture war consume everything that it um, that it touches. And there was always a like that was the initial impetus is is political polarization in the US as somebody who, you know, broadly speaking, thinks the US is imperfect, but but good and a, and a net good in most of what it does, especially in its underlying principles, as long as we can stay true to them and keep and keep trying to move ever closer to those ideals. Um, like that, that seems that seems just like such a, a noble and important project in the world um, that is largely being, uh, I don't know, but, destroyed might be a hyperbolic word, but it, it feels like a lot of the, those underlying principles are at stake as the culture war escalates, as things become increasingly authoritarian and, and um, you know, sides just going to war with one another. Um, so the idea of the citizen within is, is actually, it's very similar to a lot of what we've been talking about. It's, it's about Re reclaiming this idea of what it means to be a citizen um, as somebody who who takes this responsibility of preserving these ideals and these values. Um, yeah, it, it takes that idea seriously. Um, it's about understanding that a lot of what we see in the world in terms of the strife and discord is actually a, a, a projection of parts of ourselves, um, about understanding that there are parts of ourselves that are inflamed when we see we see outrageous media news and headlines when people stoke our fears that those are actually things that we need to learn to control within ourselves before we can ever hope to 
you know, make change or be a leader in the, in the real world. It's like fixing our, our relationship with ourselves in order to fix the world around us. Like that's one of those, one of those ideas that sounds so, um, I don't know. It just sounds so tacky, but I've just seen it to be true again and again and again. Me too. So that, that was part of it. And I think a lot of the work that I was doing over there was like, Yeah, it's just a sense-making project. It's just a, a space to sort of flesh out my thoughts and try to try to actually be a citizen. Like, I, I don't know, I started defining what that means is like this identity that I wanna step into, this person who's who understands what they're fighting for and is courageous and is is brave enough to to say what they truly mean regardless of whether it comes with, with social consequences. Um, but I, what I kept finding was that I'm, I'm just so tired of, and exhausted by anything having to do with politics. I don't like time, like spending my time in that world. I don't like thinking about it very much. I don't like, um, yeah, I just generally don't like creating the content, even though I have things to say, like, the actual work of running that site and turning it into what it could be right now is just feeling not that enticing. And I'm, yeah, I guess I'm just in this spot where I don't know what to do with that because there is that part of me that thinks it's, that thinks it's a duty or a responsibility to say what I believe. And, you know, even if a hundred people ever see it, like I do believe in that bottom up ideal is like, being a citizen online and, and encouraging other people and giving other people permission to do that and planting those seeds, um, it can have a real measurable impact over time. But then there's also that part of me that believes that creating things online should be fun and playful and nice and that you should enjoy yourself and make friends and all of this other stuff that we've been talking about. And that is increasingly not there in this particular context. And I don't know how to resolve that tension or what to do with it. So it, it kind of feels like it's on hiatus. It's just kind of sitting there. Um, I have so much to say, so many things mapped out like projects and like broadly speaking, I want to like undermine the culture war and really explain like what this thing is and all of the various ways that it's playing out in society and how it's like constantly escalating and where it leads to if it, if left unchecked. Um, but then I actually get into doing the work on that. And it's just like, ah, this fucking thing again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't really know where I'm at with it, to be honest. Mm, fair. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it's been a theme of sort of catching you at a, at a sort of period of transition from like one chapter to another. And I uh, have a lot of sort of confidence in the different ideas that you've been interested in and the ways that you want to show up in the world. And I, you know, I've seen how the, uh, ideas that you have have been valuable for me and the projects I'm trying to do. So I'm curious to see where that transition will lead you and, and what you'll kind of share with the world as that progresses. Thanks, Tasha. That means a lot, man. I, yeah, it just, like, it's, and like, that's the thing is like, you're the type of person I'm, I'm trying to reach more of who's, you're just out there being like a meta warrior and, and making cool ass music videos and like writing really interesting, thoughtful, long form shit that like is, I don't know, it's just really thought provoking. And I don't know, man, like more power to you, like keep it up. Thanks, man. Yeah, I think that's that's a big part of why it resonated for me is like uh, just what I'm trying to do in the world and what I feel like I have to offer. It was like uh, the ungated materials that you've created are like, yeah pretty squarely, squarely, uh, you know, I'm in your niche. So even if that's not the approach you're taking anymore, I was like, oh yeah, this is for me. So um, is there anything sort of adjacent to or nearby anything that we've talked about that you'd like to dive into more or say more about? The thing that I kind of want to pick your brain about is Twitter alts. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly know what direction to take that, but I'm well, I don't know. I, I'm thinking a lot about this idea of like totally uninhibited creativity, the kind that 
at least presumably, or at least hypothetically, can only come from being totally anonymous online and having very little, if any, of the weird social or identity pressures that that would come from like creating under your own name. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm just curious what your what your thoughts are on that. Hmm. Yeah, this has definitely changed over time for me. I, I first created an alt uh, two years ago now, almost two years ago, and uh, I'm currently have like six accounts or so that I'm running. It's it's gone up and down over the years, but uh, it's been more than six at some points. But um, yeah, I, I've recently framed it of like there seems to be sort of two schools of thought with this of like. One is just uh, have one account that is like your one place that you put everything and just be who you are there and like don't don't have multiple accounts, don't have multiple facets of who you are, just post it all there and if people want to subscribe to it, they can and if they don't, they don't have to. Um, that um, in some ways that's worked for me and in other ways it hasn't. Um, and over time I've sort of gone into the other school of thought, which is, uh, I guess you could say, like, have multiple accounts for multiple needs. And if there's a clear different need that you have, or different topic you want to talk about, or different uh, sort of group that you want to reach, then try it out and see how that goes. And um, most of the different accounts that I have, I'd say, are more about, like, something like progressive degrees of disclosure of who I want to be talking to. And, like, about what and so my main is like a broadcast for everyone and then I have an alt that's just like kind of a water cooler sort of thing for friends and then uh an alt that's like much more personal where it's just like hey this is my personal life like the emotions I'm having what's happening in my relationships in my sex life in my spiritual practice that kind of thing for like people that might want to hear about that and then um, I have other accounts for other purposes that are maybe like I have one that's just for me, for example. So that's another degree of disclosure and, um, you know, other, other ones that have other purposes that are not so much about degrees of disclosure, but sort of like what type of content I'd want to produce or who it's targeted at. And, um, for me, embracing the multiplicity has been a much better approach. And over time, those sort of different facets of who I am or the kinds of things I want to talk about have sort of integrated into, into main of like, I show myself more and more and more facets of myself mm. on main and in my public presence, but uh, it helps to have like a safe place to start. So like, yeah, actually talking about sexuality is a great example. Like a couple of years ago, that would have been terrifying for me to talk about publicly of like, oh, oh God, are people going to judge me? Are they going to criticize me? Um, you know, it felt really vulnerable to talk about. And over the years of having an alt and trying to express myself, it's like, oh yeah, this is a safe thing to talk about. It depends how you talk about it and to what end, but like, it's okay to acknowledge that I'm a sexual person, for example, uh, right. everyone else is too. It's not a big deal. Uh, you know, if I'm getting into gory details or making someone uncomfortable, that's something different, but just acknowledging it or talking about it isn't, isn't a big deal. And, um, yeah, like that's that's sort of an obvious example, but there are other examples of things that it feels safer to talk about at first in a like private, intimate group of friends. And then over time, I can start to express different aspects of myself more publicly. And so it's not really like, I don't know, it's not like there are like secret sides of myself that I'm not showing the world. I actually try to show as much as I can publicly as possible, but sometimes it's safer to start privately and then like integrate that into the main. And it's almost like... Um, for people that are familiar with software, it's like it's like branches of software development of like right. over time it gets integrated into the main trunk and then you branch something off to like work on something and it comes back into main. So uh, it's been like that for me. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I, I still don't have a, a proper alt, but mm -hmm. what I do have is, uh, uh, you know, like a secondary account for Citizen Within mm -hmm. that I've decided, or I've decided is my political Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, that's really, and it's, it's not just a, a like, not a only, like I'm only just following like political things there and talking about it, but the way that I keep thinking about this is it's um, like, there is this alternate identity or maybe an alternate ego who I just called Citizen Rob. It's very uncreative, mm -hmm. um, but it's a chance to 
like it, it feels like an arena for me to be able to demonstrate my values and a chance for me to be able to act in a way that I believe is is true and, and virtuous in the world. Like it's a chance to have sort of an aspirational identity um, and to really have this container where that's how I want to show up and that where like I it's safe enough for me to show up that way. And it's actually kind of a game for me to show up that way. Um, and I don't know that that's a, I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's a, like a good use of a, a Twitter account, but it feels like something that could be worthwhile. But like, I, again, I run into that same problem of just being like exhausted by politics. Like I switched over to that account and like scroll through that feed and I'm just like, oh my God, I'm so mm -hmm. exhausted by all this. I don't want to participate in these conversations. But like, that's, that's one of the areas where I'm playing with, but I, I kind of feel like it's time for me just to start a proper alt, hmm. um, completely, completely anonymous or pseudonymous and um, just go be weird and completely uninhibited. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's actually a couple of variables there of like, whether it's public or locked, whether it's connected to your name or not. Also, whether you have a profile picture that's your face or something else, like those are actually distinct variables that aren't all the same. And um, there's like a time and a place for pretty much everything. And, you know, I think it's great that you have a separate account for citizen within, I think it's really nice to have a private locked account just for friends. I think it's nice to have an anonymous one that you can post freely. I've, I've found that useful in the past and they all serve different purposes. And, you know, like you said earlier, there's no right answer. So like the things that you find yourself wanting or needing are the things that I would go with rather than like, yeah, there's no like right proper answer for it. I think the, the answer is just like my intuition is telling me to start a, mm -hmm. a proper alt, maybe mm -hmm. even a locked alt. I don't, I don't know if I need that yet, but mm -hmm. it's just like a, a total creative playground mm -hmm. um, where I can go be as, as weird as I want. Mm -hmm. um, that feels, that feels correct to me at this point in time. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Maybe I'll see you on the timeline and not recognize you. <laughs> If you're anonymous again. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I hear. You're like, I have six accounts. I'm like, how many people am I following? <laughs> They're all me. I don't know. <laughs> Just like 80% of my timeline yeah. is you. Yeah. All yeah. of all of the anonymous accounts are Tasha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me and Michael Ashcroft and James and you know whoever yeah. else. Yeah. There's there's several of yeah. us. There's like three or four of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, uh. Anything yeah. else you want to talk about or say more about? Hmm. No, we've covered a lot of ground. Sure I think have. I think this there's warrants uh, like a follow up conversation, mm -hmm. um, especially because I don't know. I feel like I, again I'm like being rebirthed out into the world as a completely different type of marketer and business person um, than I was a year ago. And it'll be interesting to see how, again, like how that, like my vision of what that is holds up to reality and how it changes over time. Cause I, I'm pretty, I was gonna say resigned to the fact, I, I guess I'm excited by the fact that it's gonna change. Like I'm open, I'm open and delighted to the fact that it's, it's gonna change over time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. And especially some of these questions around around business models and, and how to do it in a, in a generous aligned way and how to, and I don't know, just keep figuring out like what we've, what we've learned about how to show up as a cool, unique, friendly, creative person on the internet um, mm -hmm. who, who doesn't buy into a lot of the, the silly nonsense that, that makes its way around the business ecosystem. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, man, but yeah. I'm I'm just excited to see how this all evolves is the short version of all of that. Yeah, me too. Me too, both on your end and my end and the internet. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to compare notes in the future. So, but in the meantime, thank you for speaking with me today. It's really delightful to learn more about you and the work you're doing and to share that with the world. And yeah, thanks for talking with me about everything. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for the convo. Yeah, dude, this was a, this was a lovely conversation and Hopefully, hopefully somewhat articulate in terms of what I'm trying to do. I have no idea anymore. It feels like it's all just been sort of turned on its head over the past year, but hopefully. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Caught you in a time of change. It's good to get the snapshot, so.
All right. Take care, friend. Right on. Thanks again, Tosh. See you around, buddy.